Welcome to online worship at All Saints Episcopal Church in Chelmsford, Massachusetts. We also have in-person worship services here at the church. If you've been worshiping with us online during the pandemic but have never been here, I invite you to come and join us during one of those services. We'd love to meet you. The schedule for those services can be found right on the front page of our website. Otherwise, though, you're welcome to continue joining us in this way. So let's begin. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The first reading is from Lamentations. This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my potion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for one to bear the yoke in youth, to sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it, to put one's mouth to the dust, there may yet be hope, to give one's cheek to the smiter and be filled with insults. For the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. The word of the Lord. Let's read Psalm 30 together. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up. You have not let my enemies triumph over me. O my Lord, I cried out to you, and you restored me to health. You brought me up, O Lord, from the dead. You restored my life as I was going down to the grave. Sing to the Lord, you servants of his. 
give thanks for the remembrance of his holiness. For his wrath endures but the twinkling of an eye, his favor for a lifetime. Weeping may spend the night, but joy comes in the morning. While I felt secure, I said, I shall never be disturbed. You, Lord, with your favor, made me as strong as the mountains. Then you hid your face, and I was filled with fear. I cried to you, O Lord. I pleaded with the Lord, saying, What profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you or declare your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my wailing into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Therefore, my heart sings to you without ceasing. O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. A reading from the second letter to the Corinthians. As you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he has become poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter, I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years. She had endured much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd, and touched his cloak. For she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, 
Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talita kum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Ancient books are usually populated by heroes that are larger than life, uh, mighty kings, and courageous warriors. The Bible, by comparison, is full of stories about overlooked people, and it holds them up as unlikely heroes to be examples for us. It is a book where younger brothers are the ones who inherit, where unarmed slaves emerge victorious while armies fail, and women are frequently the main characters. It is a book that even when we are feeling jubilant, greets us with, oh, how the mighty have fallen. Biblical heroes are never above the human condition. Instead, in that humanity with its sickness, pain, sin, and guilt, they discover that, contrary to every expectation, what matters in life is not what they lack, but what they have, even when it is nothing more than a stubborn faith in God and a steadfast hope in God's love for them. Of course, this is all deliberate. It is meant to teach us, as the Bible says, that the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Each of these unlikely characters is meant to lead us to look beyond outward appearance, to look for more than demonstrations of human strength, and to see in a new way. Today I'd like to draw attention to one of those characters, the bleeding woman in the gospel reading. Her story appears you know, not just here, uh, but in three out of the four gospels. It's a story the Bible wants us to hear. We're not told much about her other than she had been bleeding for 12 straight years. Whatever age you are, 12 years is a long time. We're also told that she was penniless because she had spent all she had on physicians who were not only not able to cure her, but also increased her suffering. Who knows what primitive remedies she endured. Other than that, we're not told about what her life was like for the 12 years before this day. But we can figure it out. One of the books of the law that governed her life is named Leviticus, and it is in our Bible. That not often read book these days has a majestic vision of worshiping God by living in such a way that everything in the created world remains where God created it to be 
as God created it to be. Blood, therefore, is clean when it's inside the body, but is considered unclean when it is found where it should not be, that is, outside the body. It says in chapter 15 that if a woman continues to bleed beyond the expected time, she's considered unclean for as long as she bleeds. So also is the bed on which she lies and everything she sits upon. Indeed, everyone who comes into contact with her and what she's touched shall be considered unclean until they wash their clothes themselves and wait until evening. Basically, this law for 12 years placed her in the same category as lepers and dead bodies. These things had a contagious ritual unclean, uncleanliness because they were out of the natural condition. They were wrong. To be hers to say to yourself, I make everything I touch unclean. In the story, the bleeding woman presses her unclean body through the large crowd surrounding Jesus. The people she bumped into in the crowd likely knew who she was. Her goal, we're told, was to touch the clothes of Jesus. She didn't do this to make him unclean. Somehow she had faith that rather than making him unclean, he would make her clean. She said to herself, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. It's the opposite of what she'd been told. I make everything I touch unclean. I wonder where she found the strength. How did the mind and heart of this woman who had lost so much come to believe something so wonderfully new? It is likely, likely that, like us, she had heard more biblical books than that single passage from Leviticus. Take, for example, our reading from Lamentations today. This is a book written by someone who watched the Jerusalem temple burn to the ground as its priests were being slaughtered. In those circumstances, he writes, This is what I call to mind that gives me hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. In most of the Psalms, the psalmist is struggling, struggling through uh, hardships, pain, and disappointment. In today's Psalm, the psalmist complains to God, What profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you or declare your faithfulness, God? Through the very prayerful honesty of that complaint, however, the psalmist comes to a very different spiritual place. He confesses by the end of the psalm, You've turned my wailing into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Therefore my heart sings to you without ceasing. O Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. Lamentations, this psalm, and so many other passages of scripture open up paths through circumstances that we might be overcome by otherwise without them. Even after bleeding and being untouchable for 12 years, this woman's faith pushed her forward with expectation that something new would happen that day if she found Jesus and touched him. One of the most remarkable things about Jesus is that he always chose love over ritual purity. He sought out lepers touched the dead, and didn't say anything negative about being touched by this unclean woman. He himself, even as he had caused such a scandal earlier in rejecting the distinction between clean and unclean food. You know, he famously teaches just two chapters later in the Gospel of Mark, listen to me, all of you, and understand. Do not see... Uh, do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile? It's what comes out of a person that defiles. 
For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. For Jesus, God's love in the human heart overcomes all impurity. It overcomes all human judgments about what is in and out of place, what is clean and what is unclean, what is right and what is wrong. She had finally sought out a physician who could help her. But why is it so? What's so special about Jesus? We know that he, you know, like her, was no stranger to humiliation. Quoting one of the earliest Christian hymns that we have, St. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, Though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be held on to, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. This Jesus would one day drink humiliation and shame all the way down to the dregs in his death on the cross, and then overcome it. It is one of his superpowers, as he again and again makes the humiliations of others his own, heals them, and turns them into something, well, that, you know, looks like justice. This is the Jesus we continue to know, the Jesus of the Christian church. But notice that Jesus, rather than drawing attention to who he was or what he did, uh, says to her, well, daughter, it is your faith that has made you well. He acts as if the greater part of the story was what she brought to that moment by leaving her sickbed and pressing through the crowds to get to him. Well, maybe it was. The greater part of the story was uh, what she brought to Jesus, not what she lacked. It's hard to know exactly what is being asked of us by this story, which sets her before us as an example to follow. She went looking for Jesus to touch him. It's not like we can just travel to where Jesus is and press through the crowds to find him. Since it is not something we can any longer do, you know, with our feet and hands, it involves the work of the heart and mind. Jesus once said to his disciple Thomas, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. For those of us, then, who have not seen, our seeking is more inward, but just as real and frequently just as desperate. There are a lot of things we can search for in this life. Certainly there are a lot of things other than Jesus. But it is worth asking of each of these things, will this thing that I am seeking heal me? Will it make me whole? By asking that question, I think you will find, just like the woman we are talking about today did, that there are many costly physicians, but few true healers. It matters who you seek out. She never, she never settled for less than Jesus, and we shouldn't either. She persisted. Well, and we should too. To be like her, it seems to me, doesn't ask us to rise above the human condition but it does involve nothing less than cultivating the kind of faith and expectation she had, even in hard circumstances. And we still all, right, have those. We always seem to be facing something opposing us. About this, Jesus also said, every day's trouble is enough for the day. To be like her is to nurture that kind of faith and keep it young in us. If you search for Jesus with your heart and mind, you will find him. He's the one who said, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. Ask and it will be given to you. When you find him, touch him. Like her, you won't make him unclean. He will make you clean. May the God whose steadfast love never ceases, whose mercies never come to an end, 
who turns our wailing into dancing and clothes us with joy. Overcome whatever obstacles we are facing. Give us the faith to keep seeking with open hearts and outstretched hands and make us whole. Amen. Let us profess our faith as we say together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are in form five. In peace, let us pray to the Lord for the Holy Church of God, that it may be filled with truth and love and be found without fault at the day of your coming. We pray to you, O Lord. For Michael, our presiding bishop, for Alan and Gail, our bishops, for Paul, our interim rector, for Deacon Valerie Cowart, for all bishops and other ministers, and for all the holy people of God, we pray to you, O Lord. In the Anglican Communion, we pray for the Church of Pakistan United. In our diocese, we pray for Grace Church, New Bedford, St. Andrew's Church, New Bedford, St. Martin's Church, New Bedford, the Society for the Relief of Widows, the Widowers and Orphans of Episcopal Clergy, and for the Society for the Relief of Aged or Disabled Episcopal Clergy. We also pray for the faith communities in Chelmsford, and especially for our parish, All Saints Episcopal Church. For all who fear God and believe in you, Lord Christ, that our divisions may cease, and that all may be one as you and the Father are one, we pray to you, O Lord. We pray for those joining in God's mission in our parish, especially for those serving as acolytes this summer. For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray to you, O Lord. For those who do not yet believe, and for those who have lost their faith, that they may receive the light of the gospel, we pray to you, O Lord. We pray for those in the armed forces and for their families, especially for those who've been deployed overseas and for all others serving our country. For the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples, we pray to you, O Lord. For those in positions of public trust, especially Joe, our president, and Charlie, our governor, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person. We pray to you, O Lord. For a blessing upon all human labor and for the right use of the riches of creation, that the world may be freed from poverty, famine, and disaster. We pray to you, O Lord. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer. For refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger that they may be relieved and protected, we pray to you, O Lord. For this congregation, that we may be delivered from hardness of heart and show forth your glory in all that we do, we pray to you, O Lord. 
for ourselves, for the forgiveness of our sins, and for the grace of the Holy Spirit to amend our lives, we pray to you, O Lord. We pray for those in our parish in need of healing, for Amy, Linda, Molly, Nate, and Garrett. And we pray for family and friends of our parishioners, for Kerry, for John and his family, for Chris, Dan and his family, for Brian, Kristen, Ruth Ellen, Christine, Diana, and Robert, for Vicki, Judy, Barbara, Patty, Linda, Barry, Sarah, Tom, Sarah, and their family, and for Scott. We pray for those who are at home, in nursing homes, or living with chronic illnesses, for Terry, Chaz, Jeanette, Larry, Ken, Catherine, Garrett, and Ginny. For all who have commended themselves to our prayers, for our families, friends, and neighbors, that being freed from anxiety, they may live in joy, peace, and health, we pray to you, O Lord. For the life of Margie, a beloved parishioner who died this past week, we pray to you, O Lord. For all who have died in the communion of your church and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints, they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal, we pray to you, O Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, our fast from Holy Communion does not arise out of any lack of devotion to you, but out of the love you have commanded that we have for one another. Give us strength to endure and bless this fast so that our spiritual hunger will lead us to worship you as one family once again gathered around your altar, where with your Son, Jesus Christ, you live and reign with the Holy Spirit, one God, unto ages of ages. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God. And the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Let us go forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God.